we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for joining us to celebrate the life of M Mady Hall Zuma, Black women's global activism during Jim Crow and apartheid. My name is Heather and I'm the Senior Publicity Manager at the University of Illinois Press. And I'm just gonna go over some brief logistical information and introduce our guests before we get started. First of all, thank you so much to Dr. Hendricks, Dr. White, and Dr. Gilmore for being here today. They're gonna to talk for about 45 minutes and then we will have time for a 15 minute Q&A at the end. You can enter questions throughout the event by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You can use promo code MHX40 to get a 40% discount on the book on the University of Illinois Press website. The promo code and a link to the book can be found in the chat box. We will also be recording the event and posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. You'll receive an email from Zoom after the event that will have both the discount code and a link to our YouTube channel as well. And now I will just briefly introduce our guests. Wanda A. Hendricks is a distinguished professor emerita at the University of South Carolina. She served as a national director of the Association of Black Women Historians from 2003 to 2005, was a senior editor of the three volume Black Women in America, second edition, published by Oxford University Press, and is currently an editor for the book series, Women, Gender and Sexuality in American History at the University of Illinois Press. She has published a number of articles and essays, including a recent essay on Black women in politics in the National Women's History Museum's anthology, Determined to Rise, Women's Historical Activism for Equal Rights, published in August, 2022. Her books include Gender, Race, and Politics in the Midwest, Black Club Women in Illinois, and the first biography of Black activist and intellectual Fanny Barrier Williams called Fanny Barrier Williams, Crossing the Borders of Region and Race, which was awarded the Letitia Woods Brown Prize and published by the University of Illinois Press. The Life of Mady Hall Zuma, Black Women's Global Activism During Jim Crow and Apartheid is the first biography of Hall Zuma. Deborah Gray White is a Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of History at Rutgers University and a Distinguished Fellow at the Rutgers Institute for Global Racial Justice. She is the author of Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South, Too Heavy a Load, Black Women in Defense of Themselves, 1894 to 1994, Several K through 12 Textbooks on United States History, and Let My People Go, African Americans, 1804 to 1860. In 2008, she published an edited work entitled Telling Histories, Black Women in the Ivory Tower, and Freedom on My Mind, A History of African Americans, a co-authored college text, is in its third edition. As a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., and as a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow, White conducted research on her newest book, Lost in the USA, American Identity from the Promise Keepers to the Million Mom March, published by the University of Illinois Press. She holds the Carter G. Woodson Medallion and the Frederick Douglass Medal for Excellence in African American History, and was also awarded a doctorate in humane letters from her undergraduate alma mater, Binghampton University. From 2016 through 2021, she co-directed the Scarlet and Black Project, which investigates Native Americans and African Americans in the history of Rutgers University, and is co-editor of the three-part series that explores this history. She is also an editor for the Women, Gender, and Sexuality in American History series at the University of Illinois Press. Glenda Elizabeth Gilmore is a Peter V. and C. Van Woodward Professor of History Emerita at Yale University. She was also in the African American Studies Department and the American Studies Department. Her books include Gender and Jim Crow, Women and the Politics of White Supremacy in North Carolina, 1898 through 1920, Defying Dixie, The Radical Roots of Civil Rights, 1920 through 1950, These United States, The Making of a Nation, 1890 to the Present with Thomas DeGruy, and Romero Bearden in the Homeland of His Imagination, An Artist Reckoning with the South, published in May 2022. She is a fellow of the Society of American Historians and has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Humanities Center, the American Association of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, and the Institute for Advanced Study at Radcliffe at Harvard University. She is the current president of the Southern Historical Association. And now, without further ado, I will turn it over to our panelists. Thanks again to everyone for being here today. Uh, well, before we begin, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the University of Illinois Press uh, and uh, Heather uh, for featuring this book, uh, virtual book event. Um, and thanks, of course, to Galinda and Deborah for helping me celebrate the publication of The Life of Mady Hall Zuma by agreeing to participate in this event. Um, and I really want to thank uh, Don Durani for encouraging me to submit the book uh, to Women, Gender, and Sexuality in American History series 
which has been publishing for over three decades now. Um, and thanks to my co-editor colleague, Susan Kahn and Deborah Gray White for supporting the project. Um, and I owe a really big thanks to Dr. Alexandria Russell for her unwavering support of me and commitment to highlighting this project. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the audience for attending, uh, in addition to professional colleagues and personal friends, uh, members of my family, members of the YWCA community in particular in the United States and in other places in the world, um, especially Elaine Carson, uh, Carson and Anitra McMillan, uh, who made it possible for me to understand how important the YWCA was to Mady Hall Zuma. Um, and then, of course, to my neighbors in Melrose Heights, um, uh, including the morning walkers, the bikers, the, uh, uh, and everyone else who um, I am always in conversation with. Sometimes I can't quite make it back home <laughs> after my walk. Um, but uh, anyway, I want to thank them very much for their support over the years for all of my projects. And I uh, am uh, very appreciative of everyone uh, who is attending uh, this event. Uh, what's what's going to happen next is that I want to show you a uh, PowerPoint slide. It's short. I promised Deborah and Linda that I wouldn't go into real detail about it, but I want you to hear um, Mady Hall Zuma speaking her own name, for, especially for those of you who have no clue who she is, which is probably about 90% or more of the audience. Uh, and also just some clips of why um, I wrote this book and seeing her, particularly through the YWCA, both in the United States as well as uh, Africa. So um, Heather and Dr. So the next slide will be of Mady Hall Zuma and um, her saying her name. I'm Mrs. Mady Hall Zuma in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, this is a picture of her in 1921 uh, that was taken from Winston-Salem State University uh, archive. Um, so you hear her name. Uh, it is Mady Hall Zuma. Sometimes she's called Maddie and other things, but she says her name is Mady Hall Zuma. So the way she pronounces it, of course, is not the way it would be pronounced in South Africa. I'm well aware of that. She was too. Um, and so she made it more palatable for those of us who were American and were only able to say um, Zuma uh, instead of the Kosa uh, uh, pronunciation. Um, Heather, num slide number three. Uh, the slide is coming up. This is just a collage of what the YWCA actually did um, so that you can be aware. It's uh, three films put together. Uh, the Harriet Tubman YWCA, it's, it is a silent, uh, they were silent films. Um, the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA in Charlotte, the first one is uh, in Durham. Uh, the, uh, the, next, the second one was the YWCA in Charlotte, North Carolina. And then the last one is the YWCA in Harlem, uh, New York in 1940, talking about beauty culture, which is also a part of the book. I've mentioned all of these, uh, what they're doing here um gathering together they're making clothing um and then you will see them uh, this young woman is writing home telling people at home about beauty culture and what good grooming is and how important it is um and so this is the harlem y in 1940. Uh, and the, so you're getting to see what the Y women, or I call them Y women, were actually doing these young african-american uh, uh, girls and uh, women uh, were in, how, what they were engaged in in the Y, teaching them skills of all sorts, uh, and particularly the the beauty culture culture industry, which was fascinating to me in and of itself. And the next slide is of me uh, surrounded by some wonderful staffers at the World YWCA in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, in the background, you can see in, on the gold-plated uh, 
um, plaque on the building, World uh, Young Women's Christian Association. Uh, I went there in 2019 and these um, wonderful women helped me navigate Geneva as well as the World Y archives. Uh, I had no idea what the World Y actually was. Um, I kept thinking it was a USA wide, but there were two different entities. And, uh, and so this is me actually going to the world wide. And it also is to distinguish Mady Hall Zuma once she actually goes to Africa and why she becomes a major part uh, of the world wide. And uh, actually um, it's elected to its executive committee. And then the next slide is actually showing Cape Town, South Africa. This is a very modern picture, as you can tell, came from Google. Uh, and, and so it does not look like Cape Town in 1940 when Mady got there, but I wanted you to see what it looks like and that she's going to come there and dock, um, the ship is going to dock there and she will live there until 1963. Um, the next slide is of her um, members of um, the um, Zenzeli YWCA that she created. Um, at their leadership training workshop in Benoni in June of 1953. The yellow, the person with the yellow circle around her head is Mady Hall Zuma. Uh, but these are the women with whom she engaged uh, and there were multiples in Zaley Watts all over uh, across South Africa. The next slide uh, is um, Mady Hall Zuma in London, England in 1955. It is at this meeting that she <clears throat> would actually be elected to the executive committee. Uh, and if you notice, there are all kinds of women there. The two women that she's standing beside with her coat on are women dressed in a particular kind of garb. So you know that they um, suspecting some, uh, at least one of them probably um, maybe is from India. Uh, and so her world opened up in ways that uh, I was uh, complete, truly shocked uh, uh, to see. So I have two more slides, but we'll see those hopefully at the end. Um, and, uh, it, it, uh, and I can explain those when she comes home, back home to the United States. Wanda, this is so great. Um, as someone who went to school in Wake Forest when Mady was, Halzuma was living there, I'm really interested in how you came to this project, but before that, also, what was her family background in Winston-Salem? Winston-Salem was a, a, a place that nurtured a lot of prominent African-American men, at least. Tell us about her early life and then how you came to take this up as a biography. Well, uh, I actually did not know who she was. Um, and as I uh, readers will find out in the preface, I was not going to put a preface in there, uh, but one of my colleagues down in Texas told me I needed to do this um, after he read what I wrote. Um, she um, lived next door to my great aunt uh, in Winston-Salem. My uh, Aunt Emma lived and Aunt Nola lived on Stadium Drive in Winston-Salem. Um, the city brought their property, ultimately Winston-Salem <coughs> State would, uh, would take, would, um, uh, build there, and uh, they moved on Cameron Avenue. Well, the, the house that was next door to them, because they built two houses next door to each other, uh, they were sisters, but they couldn't live in the same house. So they, so they built separate houses. And so Miss Mady was their neighbor. Miss Mady's house had been there. And actually I was reading uh, Mady Halzuma's letter when she was talking about building the cottage on Cameron Avenue, which was really sort of weird for me. Um, and so she was just the lady that came out. Uh, she had a small porch. Mont Nola had a small porch. Aunt Amos' porch was a little bit bigger. Uh, but she would come out in the mornings and she would just wave at us. And so she was just Miss Mady, uh, sort of a Southern kind of term that we all use calling um, these older women, because there was a Miss Step on the street. There was a Miss Brown. I remember these uh, women. And, and then there was Miss Mady. What I didn't realize at the time is Miss Mady didn't have a last name because my Aunt Nola couldn't pronounce it. But Miss Brown had a last name, Miss Step had a last name. Um, and so uh, I had taken a class at the, um, uh, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I was a, technically a burned out teacher who needed some intellectual stimulation in the evening and decided I'd go take some graduate classes at UNC Charlotte. And the professor that I had there 
um, yeah, you know, was on uh, South Africa. Um, I happened to enroll. I was curious about it. And so I actually, the paper, the topic that I picked was on Alfred B. Zuma. Uh, I didn't know who he was. I just picked him because he was in some of our readings. And so um, how it, it's really kind of weird how this all intersected. Miss Mady came over one day because we used to sit on the porch a lot. And she came over on the porch and happened to mention something about being in South Africa. I can't quite re recall all of the conversation. I don't even know how South Africa came up. Uh, and um, I then realized, I was, as she was talking, I was asking her some questions, but I wasn't sophisticated enough at the time to really interview her. I didn't know how to do that. Um, and so, and I, I didn't know what to ask her. I was, but I was fascinated by the fact that this black woman who lived next door to my great aunts lived in South Africa. That was just weird. So um, that I, 40 years ago, I just, I realized uh, at some point, did a little more research and figured out that she was Alfred Bettini Zuma's wife. And I had actually read some of the same letters that I was reading for this book on microfilm, not knowing that at the time. So this has been a um, four decade long kind of knowing that I was gonna do something with her, I just didn't know what. This uh, is astonishing, Wanda, that's yeah, just amazing. Wow. Yeah, uh, it, it actually is. I mean, it's, I, I'm astonished by the story myself. I actually had to go back and make sure that I was telling the truth. So I, I drove up to Winston-Salem to the houses, sitting, and they're still sitting there, um, and I was sitting there like, okay, I'm making sure this is Aunt Alma's house, this is Aunt Nola's house, and this is where Miss Mady lives. And all of that is actually, the houses are definitely still there. So I wasn't making it up. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, so this seems to be testimony to the fact that, you know, you never know who you're talking to. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> really, seriously. And you can't really judge a book by its cover because here's a woman who sits on her porch and, you know, she's got this amazing background. and. Um, you know, you go scratching around and figuring it out. So that, and that's really wonderful. And so what, I guess I'm wondering about the process, the process of writing a biography. It's it's different from other kind of history books. I, I think in some ways it's similar, some ways it's different, but tell me what you think are the challenges of following a life around the world like this? What are the challenging challenges and rewards of writing a biography? Uh, the challenges are numerous in many ways, the, and the rewards are as well. Um, I don't have a formula for writing biography. Uh, as you and Glenda both know, this is my second biography. Uh, and after the writing, the uh, Fanny biography, which was the first one, uh, the, the joke is, as Deborah knows, I said I would never write another biography ever in my life. Uh, and then I wrote another biography. So um, it is, um, I, there, I, I don't have a formula. I don't know the people who sort of do this for a living all the time and have written like, you know, five or six biographies. I don't know if they have a formula. I don't. Uh, and I couldn't really have one for either of these women. I had to come to it um, with them telling me their story. Uh, and when you're writing it, when you do those first drafts, they're really crazy. I have to get to know all the people in their lives, where they are, where they're going, et cetera. Maybe it was complicated. And in some ways, um, more complicated than Fanny Berry Williams in that she took me all over the world. I mean, in some ways, both literally and figuratively, uh, I would never have gone to Switzerland to go to the archives or Geneva, Switzerland. I just, it, it wasn't, a, it's not that I, I didn't like Switzerland, it's just that it wasn't a place that I really thought about. I went there because of her uh, and that I learned uh, how important the worldwide was. So, and yet, um, and, and these women, they take, they take a space in your head. You never get rid of them. They have to be in every chapter. You have all kinds of historical events that are going on. For Mady, it was the pandemic, which was weird, writing it at the same time that we're in the middle of a pandemic, 
Um, and because uh, she was a part, you know, she was living in the, the pandemic in 1918 and she was affected by it. Uh, so uh, here, and, and we're in a pandemic, so I was writing this book while we were in a pandemic, which was weird. Um, and then I'm writing about, I'm, I'm having to get inside of her head while she's living inside of mine. And I'm watching history, American history unfold. I mean, simple things like we, I taught, you know, when I was, um, before I retired, I taught US history classes. You know, we talk about the Model T. Well, her father gets a car. He gets one of the first cars in Winston-Salem. Uh, you know, the newspaper listed all the people who bought, had cars. So they had horses and then they had cars. And then they started getting hot water in the house. Uh, the newspaper's writing about that too because they have advertisements for you know the contraptions that make the hot water. So I am, and then she's learning to drive a car. So all these events are happening, which I taught as American history and sort of separate from everything, they're happening to her. So I am intimately engaged in what did all of this, what does it mean? It's like the computer age. What does it mean for people to get a computer? What happens to them? What happens in their family? How do, you know, how do things change? And that's what's happening with her. Um, same thing in, the same, in a similar way happened with Fanny. But um, maybe also uh, was larger because of the global context of it. I wrote about Fanny in a regional, ter uh, regional terms, because, but she was in the United States. Maybe it's truly a global figure. And I was very limited by my world history knowledge and global knowledge. So it, it was, um, I had to play catch up. Uh, in ways that I could never have imagined. And, the, and in the ways when, some ways in which the United States is sort of decentered, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily take, you know, the, uh, is uh, in front and center. Uh, and yet she is American, so you never can leave it. Um, so it is, it was, um, it, it was problematic, but it was also exceptionally rewarding because I got to go to Switzerland. <laughs> I got to intimately engage in a life and talk about South Africa. I got to know, as she explains it, the differences between a Jim Crow and apartheid. She says they're not the same, even though people talk about them as if they're the same. And people use that term even today. Um, but I also will say I was mired in Jim Crow and apartheid for years. Mm -hmm. having and also being at the same time being in the political climate in America and around the world today and I'm watching people gravitate to these sort of authoritarian kind of uh, rulers while I'm writing about what's happening in Jim Crow and apartheid um, and so that was hard to do and my neighbors in my neighborhood heard me talk about it as well and that was really hard uh, for me personally to uh, engage in that, especially living in this age. And 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 they and she and her cohorts were and Alfred B. Zuma were fighting so hard against apartheid, and that her family and Winston Salem was fighting and trying to deal with Jim Crow, figuring out how to live through it. And then I've got this modern day and. and you know, from 2020, 2022, we've got these people sort of talking about um, wanting these authoritarian, this authoritarian rule. And I'm like, okay, do you know what this means? <laughs> um, and it was, uh, it was clear to me that people really either didn't know history, <clears throat> had discarded it, or um, decided that, you know, apartheid was good and Jim Crow was great and fascism was good which is the very things that the uh, Mady Hall Zoom and Alfred B. Zuma were fighting against. Hmm. <clears throat> Let's talk about Alfred Zuma uh, just a little bit. He's a character in Defying Dixie because one of my characters goes to South Africa. And he's really beloved in his country. Can you talk about um, his political stance, its riskiness? What his legacy was, because it seems to me it's directly linked. I could be wrong about this, but it seems like it's directly linked. Ultimately, his legacy is the abolishment of apartheid, because he's the one who began 
working in an organized way, but I don't know. Can you fill in some gaps and give us an over, overview? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, you know, the ANC had been around for a while, uh, you know, and he he was educated in the United States, of course. Uh, he is, uh, he comes here, he goes to Tuskegee. So we got that Booker T. Washington connection, but Booker T. Washington is gonna die before he actually graduates. Uh, but he's over here in the United States for a long period of time, and he will become a um, physician. He will attend a number of schools in the United States, and but he will graduate from Northwestern uh, in uh, Chicago or Evanston. And, uh, and he always knew that he was learning what he could here, and he was taking it back to South Africa. His heart and his, he always knew he was going back. There was never a question. Um, uh, to quote, help his people. And so um, he is, uh, he goes back uh, in the 1920s. So he comes over here, I think it was like 1913 or somewhere in there. He doesn't get back home until like 1920s. Uh, and um, by the time, by the 1930s, uh, he is very much revered. Uh, and um, like a number of other South Africans who leave, you know, South Africa and um, come to the United States and they're educated, but Alfred B. Zuma is very much revealed, uh, revered, uh, and um, he becomes um, uh, he becomes the sort of person that people think would be the powers that be that who think that he can revive the ANC because their coffers had, were virtually empty. You know, and Stephen Gish has done a biography of him, the only biography of him. And so he talks about that in his biography that the, you know, the financial coffers, I mean, ANC was in trouble. The, the membership had declined, et cetera. So all of this is happening during the, with the depression in the 1930s in the United States. And so um, they were interested in him coming, you know, being a part of helping to lead the ANC and to revive it. And uh, he ultimately, that's exactly what he does. So he's very much beloved uh, and he does. So and by the time Mehdi Halzuma gets there in 1940, um, he has now, he, he, he had actually given them sort of a semi, okay, you can put my name up for election as president. And by the time maybe actually comes, he tells him, yes, I'm, I'm going to do it, which signals that he had spoken, you know, he had spoken with her, that she knew now what was about to happen. Uh, and as Stephen Gish calls them, they become sort of the first, uh, the sort of first black family of South Africa. And um, he is, uh, has to build the organization. It was an organization that was sort of in shambles. Uh, people hadn't, they were, had, it was decentralized. Uh, they really weren't, there, there was no real, they didn't feel like they had to do um, anything in a central way that each group was doing something, each uh, branch was doing something different and they really weren't answering to uh, anybody in particular. Uh, and so it was in disarray. And uh, um, Alfred Zuma, in, at the end of 1940, sort of takes over and he has a mission. He wants to increase the enrollment. He helps to create the Youth League, which Nelson Mandela uh, is the young guy at this time is going to become a part of the Youth League. And we all know Man Mandela, you know, who will become president of South Africa uh, and that he was jailed all those years and then he would become president. At this time, he's sort of a, he's, the, he's part of the younger generation. Um, and so uh, Alfred Zuma sets out with his wife, uh, uh, Mady Hall Zuma, they create a formidable partnership and their goal is to revive the ANC, which is exactly what he does for nine years from 1940 to 1949. Uh, he is technically ousted in 1949, in part because the young generation, the Nelson Mandela's of that generation have decided that they want to fight the South African government in a different way. And uh, Alfred B. Zuma, if you want me to compare him to, him to somebody in the United States, people would probably say that he, his, he was more conservative. And if we, and I hate doing this, but we need to compare him more like Booker T. Washington, if you will. Um, and uh, because the young generation saw him as too conservative by, you know, by the 19th, by 19, the late 1940s. 
Um, but he, yeah, he let me just stop you leaning. What, but still, wasn't it incredibly, and I, I guess we should get back to her, but wasn't it incredibly dangerous, more dangerous than the work Booker T. Washington would have been doing here, the work that Zuma was doing in South Africa? Oh, of course. Yeah, I'm way more dangerous for okay. him. So I'm glad you raised that because it is way more dangerous. And those are the differences between what will come, what will be apartheid, what's going to come in 1948, so just right. before he is ousted, and what happens in the United States. Uh, and so, it, but even at that time, it was dangerous, even before apartheid, because racism was very much a part of South Africa. It wasn't like they were not racist and then all sort of apartheid came and everybody, you know, and then it became racist. Uh, but apartheid does something different than okay. uh, what they had, you know, had before. Okay. So the draconian measures that were implemented. But yes, you're exactly right. It was very dangerous for what he was doing, but he did it anyway. Um, uh, and uh, was so committed to it. Um, and, you know, it, they, uh, he was devastated that they ousted him. Uh, this was not something that he anticipated uh, happening, but it was a generational shift. If, 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 if nothing else, it was a generational shift. If, if I could jump in here, um, you know, one of the things that I really liked about what you did, besides bringing Mady out of the shadows, you know, and, and making her uh, a, a real important part of not only the ANC, but of um, the women's movement in South Africa. But there's another part of this, and and it's in the book, and I know that you had some issues, not some issues, but getting to the bottom of their romance. You know, we don't generally talk about the pleasures, the, you know, we want it, we want to stick with the, the, the politics and, you know, the fight against racial oppression and all. But here's a woman who goes to South Africa. You know, she's, she's middle-aged, if not a little bit advanced, and, and she's well into her middle-aged years. Um, and their romance is basically by, via mail. Um, I'd like you to talk just a little bit about that, how they met, um, and something that, uh, you know, explain why you think she went to South Africa, okay? You know, there's always the political, there's always the race work, but there's always something else and something more. And I'd like, I'd like um, our listeners to hear a little bit about, you know, their relationship and what uh, she brought to the table for him and what he did for her. Well, let me start first with, she's gonna become the president of the African National Congress Women's League. Um, so readers will discover that. Um, so they're working in concert. Um, so if she becomes this American, she's, she's an American black woman and she becomes the, the, the uh, president of the African National Congress Women's League, which is really weird when you think about it. Um, and so uh, there, there's that. So they, they create this formidable partnership. So the romance, um, let me say first that I was not gonna write chapters uh, four and five. And it's, I mean, uh, you know, chapters four and five and particularly five, it was hard for me because I had to become a psychologist, a historical psychologist if there was any such thing. And I was having to really sort of ferret out this, this um, relationship because you're right initially she resists him it's clear from the beginning he becomes very smitten with her when he meets her in New York because they're going to ask me how did they uh, meet and um and I, I didn't answer that but they meet in New York she's in graduate school uh getting her master's degree at Columbia University's Teachers College so and he comes there um and you know new york is this very cosmopolitan place even during the depression it still is it's, you know what people from all over the world still there and alfred Zuma, actually i now have them meeting at least twice i suspect they met more than that but i have them in, in meeting twice at least and so they meet uh in new york uh and um he is 
apparently, I mean, like really smitten with her. Now, meanwhile, he has encouraged and asked some friends to start looking for him a wife because his first wife died uh, right after the birth of their second child. And uh, she was also a YWCA woman, by the way. Uh, and, uh, and they had created a partnership uh, as well. But she died, you know, suddenly and tragically. And uh, he was a lonely man. So when he comes back to the United States, he, uh, during these speaking engagements and also looking for help, uh, money, et cetera, et cetera, for um, the people in South Africa, he is, um, he meets her. And, uh, and I have them meeting at the International House, probably through the efforts of a um, Columbia University professor that they both knew. And so uh, I have them meeting then. She's going to meet him again when he's there uh, to, uh, as an invitation for Max, for, uh, I mean, uh, Paul Robeson and Max Jurgen. And so he's gonna, they're going to meet again. But he in, apparently, I mean, he was just smitten with her. So he had enlisted these friends, asking them to help him find a wife. And so they're busy helping him find a wife. Well, now he has now met Mady, and she's going to move to the top of the list very quickly. So, and they were earnest about helping him find a wife, by the way. They were writing out, telling them who he ought to see, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm writing about, I was not, I, I really didn't want to do this. But I had to in some ways because she, in some sense, sounded like a crazy person. Who gets on a ship in 1940 in the middle of a war, because it was a European war happening, German, Germany was blowing ships out of the water. Who in their right mind gets on a ship in New York Harbor and takes a ship all the way to Cape Town, South Africa? Mm. And so she sounded a little bad. But the woman that I had met in Winston-Salem, who was the daughter of a doctor and a um, woman who had taught school and became her, an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur is what her mother became. That woman, and who was a uh, very engaged in Winston-Salem's uh, civic you know, life and Winston-Salem's cultural life, that woman was not crazy that I'd met. And yet she was, the way in which these stories about her have been presented that she just got on the ship in a New York Harbor and she sailed over to Cape Town made her sound like she must have been slightly deranged that this man that she had just met maybe once or twice and that she got on. And I was like, okay, you're going to have to talk about their love relationship, the courting part, that here it was 9,000 miles apart, that they didn't get to see each other very much. And so I had to look at her letters in a different kind of way, in a way that I never imagined that I would be doing, um, and sort of come to terms with how she comes to terms with what she's going to do. As uh, readers will find out, she initially tells him, because he was so smitten with her that he just jumped in with both feet and basically asked her to marry him. And she was like taken aback initially, like, are you crazy? I want to be your friend. You know, I like the fact we've been exchanging pictures and you've been telling me all about the world that I'm not seeing, blah, 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 blah. But I'm not marrying you and I'm not interested. Now, you told me you wanted to come over here. Well, that would be nice, but don't expect anything. Then, the, then she tells him, I've already got male friends. <laughs> you know, I have one in particular that I like. <laughs> Um, but I also like my independence. And that's the thing about her. She was very clear. Um, and so she's given us a view of Black women in the early part of the 20th century that we don't traditionally see. And because she, she tells him, I like my independence, basically. I like my life. Uh, and she had never married. And like you said, she was in her 40s by now. So um, she... She's, she forced me to think of her as a whole person with an identity in a way that I really hadn't thought of her or thought about Black women uh, having uh, outside of the family. So I was forced to do that. And then I had to go into their courtship. And, that, and, and also, I, want, I wanted readers to see them sort of dancing around this. Well, he wasn't dancing. He was clear. She was dancing around, getting closer to him. And so you see, I'm hopeful people will see the sort of slow move 
to, uh, you know, because she says in his letters, every time he wrote to her, he would ask, keep asking her to marry him. And she pretended like he wasn't doing it. She wouldn't answer that part, but she would answer everything else and describe all kinds of things. And then there's a slow move. This, it, it was a courting ritual, but they're doing it 9,000 miles apart. And then subsequently, she'll actually say, yes, I'll marry you. So the question that you ask about, why do I think that happened? I think, um, I believe, I've come to the conclusion that it was her commitment to service, her belief, strong belief like his, that <clears throat> it was the so-called quote, as Du Bois called him, the talented 10th or the people who had the education and the wherewithal and the means that it was their duty, absolute duty to help those uh, in the African-American community or the black South African community, it was their duty to do it, uh, that they could not only keep that for themselves and to themselves. And so, and, and that, that was a part of their partnership and the things that they had in common. But I also think it was their faith. One of the things I learned from doing Fanny Berry Williams is that I could not uh, ignore her faith. Now she was a, she was a Baptist in, in Brockport. She became a Presbyterian in Washington, DC. And then when she went to, when she got to Chicago, she became a Unitarian. But all of them had something in common. And that was this commitment to service uh, and duty. And Mady Hall Zumas was the same. Hers came out of her African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church family. Um, and that's what she was raised in in Winston-Salem at Goler. Um, AME Zion Church, and this is what her mother and her father taught her. And so they had that in common. So I think it was the service, it was her faith. They both, he was AME without the Zion. Um, and so they, they, it was those commitments, I think, uh, that kept them uh, going. Maybe, maybe though, I, <laughs> maybe, maybe it was pleasure. And, and, they, and the search for it. Maybe by the mid forties, there was something missing, and she could. She was in search of a fantasy. I I know. I'm only saying that because I just think that sometimes we forget. You know, we, we particularly when we're talking about uh, people like Maybe, who's a club woman before she uh, leaves the United States, and then takes up many of the same kinds of uh, uh, service issues in South Africa that she had done here in the United States. But sometimes I think that we may forget that women like her, they have sexual needs. They have a desire to, ha to see the world. They have a desire for pleasure. And maybe she wanted companionship. I'm just putting that out there. No, no, I actually agree with you. And I was going to add adventure. No, 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 I absolutely yeah. agree with you. And I was going to add adventure to, to this because it is real clear. And she even says it. She was going on her adventure. Yeah. Uh, and she was a very adventurous person. One of the things I've learned while doing this is how much these Black women were traveling. I had no idea. I mean, they're getting on planes in the 19, uh, late 40s into the 50s. I was stunned um, that they were traveling as much as they did. So she's she's not alone. I mean, Dorothy Heights traveling, uh, Mayor Matthew Bethune is traveling, uh, Charlotte Hawkins Brown is traveling. You know, either they're driving cars or getting on trains or they're getting on planes. So I didn't know all of this. You know, and traveling the world, they're not just staying in the United States. Many of them. So I I actually was going to say the adventure part. She actually does call it her adventure. Um, and so I agree. I think this was also pleasurable for her and that she was getting, and one of the things that she will do is travel the world as a pleasurable part of her life. Um, so it wasn't all work, uh, and, um, and was, uh, shaped by it when she's walking down the street in Paris, she's writing about it in her letters. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I agree. I think you're right that we tend to make these people laborers all the time, that they're working for the race and that they're never, ever seeking pleasure. And she is. She tells us that that's exactly what she's doing. Can you tell us, we've, I, I know we're going to the question and questions and answers in just a few minutes, but her work, club women's work, YWCA work, 
um, the continuation of people like those I wrote about in Gender and Jim Crow into the 30s and 40s. How did, can you think of one thing, I was going to ask in general how that translated to South Africa, but I think it might be more interesting if you just take one project that she worked on and just give us a sense of the kind of things she did and, and how they were helpful, how whether they were important, whether they lasted. Um, her work in the, uh, let me begin by saying her work in the um, ANC Women's League comes to an end, uh, just, you know, at the same time that um, Alpha Zuma is technically ousted. Alpha Zuma will still continue some work in the ANC, but, you know, his days are sort of numbered, uh, especially into the early 50s, and he moves on to other things. And she um, had, she, uh, too, with really sort of move outside of the ANC. They're still kind of, um, you know, committed to it tangentially, but um, not really engaged. So she starts the Zinzele Club in 1941. So she comes there in 40, and she starts the Zinzele Club in 1941, um, basically doing what you just said, that, you know, sort of continuing her work from Winston-Salem. This, you know, her engagement with white women, the, the civic, civic movement, uh, movements, et cetera. And so she was trying in some sense, one could argue she was trying to replicate some of those movements, uh, some of those. Um, they didn't quite work that way because she has problems at the beginning. They don't trust her. Uh, the, the new Mrs. Zuma for them, you know, she, um, she had this exceptionalist narrative about Black Americans um, she seemed very privileged, and she was. And one thing about her is she never apologized for being privileged, ever. Uh, but she did recognize her privilege. And so um, she would ultimately create the Zinzele Club, and it, it does resemble the clubs that she has in Winston-Salem um, and the YWCA. They're the women, they're the teachers, they're the nurses, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the professional women. Uh, and so it becomes a select society. So there's that. But what they do um, is ultimately they begin to bring in more people and the club begins to grow by 1950s. I mean, they're all over South Africa, these Zinzele clubs. And you also see mothers teaching their daughters about the Zinzele clubs and you get them writing because they find out about it later. I mean, they, as they age and they wanna be in the Zinzele club which is what also happens with the YWCA uh, as mothers began to transfer it on to their daughters. And that's what Mady, wa uh, Mady Halzuma wanted. Uh, so what did they do? I mean, they did the same thing she did in, in Winston-Salem, gardening. She was a, she was a master gardener. Uh, so she taught them, but they were growing uh, not only flowers for the beauty of the home and space, but also they were learning how to uh, plant food, you know, for their families to eat. Um, she also is going to, they're, they're making, I'm not a cook, but they're making things out of buttermilk. I mean, and they're, you know, they're making bracelets and they're figuring out how to make stuff to sell so that they can uh, have money, you know, to uh, do the things that they wanted to do. And one of the things that she did in, uh, in Winston-Salem was she was very much engaged in the cultural aspects of Winston-Salem. And so she is, um, uh, she brings culture, if you will, not that they didn't have culture before, but she brings a different kind of culture to South Africa. So she puts on all these shows. She had done a whole bunch of that in Winston-Salem. And so she starts putting on a, whole, a lot of these shows. But as in everything, apartheid makes us different. So she's having to do things that she never had to do in America. She had a right to you know, the uh, powers that be in South Africa and ask them if she could put on a show, especially because she was using black actors and they were playing, and one of them, they played God, they played biblical figures. And so think about that, that when they, when you uh, have black people playing these parts, you're in essence arguing that they have the right first and uh, second, that they have this sort of omnipotence that set white South Africans and Afrikaners that black people didn't have. So she had to write to the South African government, uh, you know, especially, you know, for some of her plays. And they told her no, or at least for one of them, they told her no, she couldn't do it. Hmm. So, so, but she was, they're raising money. 
So it was for the, you know, for the good. Um, and so she, so culture is very much a part of this book as well in both Winston-Salem and in South Africa. So she's got these women doing, and they write to her telling her what they've done, but she's also teaching them grooming, the same things you just saw in, um, in the film clips, uh, the collage. Um, she's teaching them about grooming and dressing at one session, and I didn't put it in there, but she was even showing them how to put on their hats, um, you know, how to dress. Uh, and she and her sister had owned a dress shop, so she was a smart dresser. Uh, and so she could teach these women how to do that. Um, and and, and this is, these are all some, some of the things they learned in the why as well. So yeah. thank you. So you're very sympathetic to Mady, even though there are times when she says things and she has these beliefs that may or may, that would make you or at least, uh, you know, raise an eyebrow. So, for example, she's in a, she's, she, you say she, she never apologized. She never apologizes for being privileged. And she has an elitist air about her. So she does believe that the the upper class is like many of the club women in, in the States. She believed that, um, that it was up to these upper class women to demonstrate respectability, to perform respectability at all times, to show white people um, as well as lower class black people, you know, how to behave and what to do and when to do it. And when she went to South Africa, she had the, uh, she had, ideas about, you know, African-American exceptionalism, you know, like African-Americans were going to be the leaders of the Black people of the world, etc. So I'm just asking you, when you read those kinds of comments, and even though they may make you wince, or, you know, these attitudes that she had, um, you still remain really sympathetic to her. So I mean, I, my question is, why? And why are you not more critical of Mady? Um, one of the things I learned while I was doing Fanny is um, as a historian, we are trained uh, to question everything. And we're also trained to analyze and to often be critical. And we should be. And you need to call it what it is. And yes. She was, uh, she did believe in an exceptionalist narrative uh, and that African-Americans were superior and she never apologized for that either. Uh, but Roy Wilkins sort of did the same thing. You know, he was in the NAACP. So there were a whole bunch of them that did it. Um, and so, uh, and yet what she does and what she believes and how she sees herself and her role in uh, the black community you can't argue with what they actually did. They didn't just talk, they actually did stuff. And so, you know, I had to step back and realize that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we need to remember what African-Americans came out of, what they were headed to when Jim Crow came, that they didn't have health, proper health care. We, I mean, we have to remember, you know, people were going hungry, uh, uh, African Americans were fleeing, you know, the South and going North looking for a promised land or something better than what they had. And so I have to also say, we can still be critical, but we also must remember what all of them put on the line and understood in ways that I'm not sure, I think sometimes we forget how bad off Black people truly were, both in America and in South Africa and all, you know, across the board. And that had it not been for them, um, I'm not real sure where we would have ended up. I might not have been here. Um, so I had to step back from that. So you're right. Um, in some ways, I am, uh, I'm, I'm less critical of her. I was less critical of Fanny because I had to, I went into them thinking I would be critical but then had to just let them tell their story and let the audience sort of decide for themselves how they wanted to see them. Uh, and, um, you know, do the best that I could. There are places where I, you know, I have to say that she was privileged because, you know, the first three chapters are about her privilege. 
Uh, so I have to say that, and the people in South Africa, many of them were afraid of her privilege and also accused her of being, uh, you know, of being privileged and not quite understanding what was happening there. So I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I probably gave her a pass in a whole lot of ways, but I've had to learn to do that and to not be the historian that I would normally be and, you know, and uh, sort of jump in with both feet and, and be critical all the way through. Well, she said it, but this is what she really meant. When in reality, what she said was exactly what she meant. Um, <laughs> so, so no, I, 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 you're right. I mean, but I did. So that's why I said, I don't have a formula for writing biography. And so I, I did, I just had to step back from it, so. We're this almost out of time, but I wanted to just ask, I, you know, this really one general, it's a really general question. And, and because I noticed that, you know, if you look at all of the, um, you look at a lot of uh, conferences are now taking up black internationalism, a lot of jobs out there about, you know, where people are looking for somebody who does black internationalism. And, and it seems to really be burgeoning as a field and as a subject you know, to understand that Black people were not just, uh, uh, particularly Black activists, weren't just uh, focused on the United States. So do you have any perspective on why it's important for us to study Black internationalism and, 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 and what it does for our understanding of African-Americans and, or and African-American history? Well, I think it's, uh, I'm just, uh, look, I'm not a, I, I, I came to this only because of Mady. Um, otherwise, I was like most Americans, you know, America was the center of everything, blah, 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 uh, which is really horrible. Uh, and that tells us that we all feel like we're exceptional because we're American um, and that we can, we can decenter the rest of the world. It's like, really? Uh, I mean, we're such a small part of it. Um, so I came to this because of Mady, uh, but I'm really happy to see what's happening because in some sense, it, it places America where it should be as a part of this larger world, not the world and everybody else around it, you know, had to conform or be uh, in it um, in the way that Americans traditionally sort of take over things. Uh, but that it simply is a part of that world. Uh, and that there was sometimes this exchange, uh, you know, and sometimes it flowed one way more than the other, but there was this exchange. So it is really great to see. Uh, I realized how little I knew about the world. And being at the World YWCA in Geneva, I realized really how little I knew. The interns there and the staff there, they spoke multiple languages. I know English. I sat in a French class, but when I went to France, Paris, France, many years ago, I couldn't speak a lick of it, couldn't understand anything anybody was saying. And so, but they did. They answered the phone, you know, in English or in uh, French or, you know, whatever, or Portuguese, whatever language uh, the person on the other end was. And then they could switch and talk to me in English. And I was like in awe of that. So um, the, it is uh, in those leadership training, you know, workshops that Mady's uh, promoting in the 1950s. That was, you know, on show. It was uh, there at the y, at the World YWCA. So it 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 decenters America uh, in a way and sort of puts it in its place um, in in these transnational studies. And it demonstrates how much in, how engaged Black people were in the world because most of us know the traditional sort of W B store W E B Du Bois story and Pan Africanism. But we really don't really know the larger uh, story. And there is a much larger story there. So uh, I came away with this knowing that I really was dumb. I didn't know world history in a way that I uh, thought I did. So. Hey, this is Heather here. I just wanted to say I'm willing to keep this going for another 15 minutes if you wanted to go through the questions um, from the audience. Um, does that sound good to you, Wanda, and everyone else? Uh, It does. Um, I don't know uh, if uh, we can also do those last two slides um, somewhere in between. Yeah, that sounds great. Do you want me to go ahead and bring those up now? Uh, yeah, if it's okay with Glenda and Deborah. 
Sure, sure, sure. And we should have questions. Let's see what we've got. Okay, yeah. I'm seeing what you've got. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, when we left off, um, you saw her uh, in London, England in 1955. And so this slide is her when she comes home to the United States. And she comes home uh, to the United States in 1963. And think about that day, uh, that year. It is the, you know, the civil rights movement. Um, you're gonna have the March on Washington. So she's going to be able to come out of Jim Crow and, uh, and apartheid, come back to the United States. And you're gonna have the um, you know, 64 legislation and then the 65 voting rights leg legislation. So she's gonna live completely different society than what she left. Um, but before she leaves South Africa, this was sort of a parting gift. Uh, the stone was laid by Mady Hall Zuma, 16th February, 1963. This picture is actually in the book. Um, and so you see the South African women who were there um, and it says in ZLA YWCA at the top. So that it was in the foyer, it's still there. Um, uh, and so that was sort of a parting gift uh, to her. And the next slide, the very last one, um, is when she actually gets home. And it is um, a couple of years uh, before she dies. Uh, and so I found this and I thought this was a great way for people to know how much she was loved in South Africa, even in 1980, because uh, this is when this was taken. Uh, and uh, this woman uh, who was a theologian in South Africa, uh, Jibaku, uh, who was banned from her country. Uh, South Africa did a lot of banning. They were either banned from the country, they were banned from a particular place in the country uh, or whatever, but she had been banned from her country and she had come to town that week um, uh, at the behest of the YWCA and she found an ally, the newspaper reported, in Mady Hall Zuma. And notice that they spelled Mady Hall Zuma's name with a Z this time, which made it a little hard sometimes for me to find her in things because sometimes it was a Z and sometimes it was with the X, which is what it, uh, how it's actually spelled. Uh, and notice at the, at the bottom, Miss Zuma, a native who married a black South African doctor and returned to South Africa with him was called a hero uh, by this woman for her role uh, in the black, black struggles there. So they still remember her um, and uh, actually people there, many people still remember her today. Uh, she still has some presence uh, in South Africa uh, today. So I wanted you to see that uh, the South Africans uh, still revered her, even if Americans had no idea who she was and just forgot about her, mm -hmm. uh, literally. Um, and so she just was the, it literally erased from our own history, but the South Africans still revered her. Uh, and that, that's really the last one, the book and the uh, global come back up. So, and the globe is there so that you can kind of see how global she really was. Uh, um, and, and that's why, you know, the book is sort of divided into three parts, the Winston-Salem part, the New York part, and then the South African part. All right, so we've got a lot of great questions that have been coming in. Um, so the first is from Fritz Hamer, and they ask, in what ways did the 1918 pandemic affect Mady? Did she lose family, and did she write extensively about it? Um, yes, Fritz, and he is one of my neighbors. Uh, yes, he, he does, uh, she does, she is affected by it. Um, it, um, her uncle actually died. He catches pneumonia. He was from South Carolina. He actually, in Columbia, really, he was a minister at a church here. And he actually uh, contracts pneumonia and he will subsequently die. She uh, actually gets really sick in Winston-Salem because she's privileged. Her father decided, uh, her father and mother decided that it would be best to send her. And apparently at the time, Florida was not as infected or it wasn't, uh, it was a good place to go recuperate. So she, they would send her to Florida. She intended initially only to stay for about a month. Uh, she stayed far longer. Uh, she ended up meeting Mayor McLeod Bethune there. Uh, she did get better. And she met Mayor McLeod Bethune there and they would uh, have a lifelong friendship. Uh, and, um, 
would set her on a, another path. Uh, but she also teaches at uh, Mary Matal Bethune School there. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, she is affected by the uh, pandemic. And, but no, she doesn't really, what she mentions it in her oral interviews, but she does not really dwell on it. Uh, so I had to do some searching on, uh, for that part. But yeah, she is very much affected by the pandemic and the city of Winston-Salem was very much affected by, by it as well. And as you know, um, what was it? Like 50 million people around the world uh, were uh, died. Uh, I think in the United States, it was 675,000 people uh, died. Uh, so, and more people have died in this pandemic than the one in 1918, which is really weird to say. Uh, so, um, yeah, and so I was mired in the pandemic, uh, a real one, at the same time that I was writing about the one in 1918. All right, so our next question is from Andrew Offenberger, and he says, can't wait to read the book. Um, so international travel, living, and marriage brings about new conceptions of the self. I'd imagine Mady Hall Zuma and Alfred B. Zuma bonded through similar experiences living under Jim Crow and apartheid, but were there any tensions between the couple as a result of their different national backgrounds? Um, if there were, I don't know about them. Uh, Mady Hall Zuma, we, we don't have uh, Alfred Zuma's, very many of his letters, but we have a whole lot of Mady's letters. So I could tell what he was saying to her by reading her letters. Um, and she wrote a lot. Um, so the, you know, the, the last parts of the book uh, or the last, yeah, the three quarter, last three, uh, three quarters of the book are full of her talking because she writes um, these really wonderful letters. And so she, I, she never says that there was a conflict. The only time I see a conflict is that at one point, once she tells him that she'll marry him, it becomes clear that she has failed to ask him, okay, so what, what is, how do you get married in South Africa? Because she marries him there and not in the United States. And he never gets to come here to visit with her family, the typical sort of normal thing that you would do. And so she, um, and she goes over there and she's the only one. Uh, and she uh, and he, when she uh, um, gets off the ship, he's not even at the dock. This this becomes a really weird story. He uh, and so she is. Uh, it's clear that a she's not quite sure how to get to South Africa. You'll see that in the letter. And so she asks him several times exactly how do I get there. And then b what you also see is her now realizing when she says yes to his marriage proposal that she doesn't understand or she doesn't know his rituals, you know? And so she has to come to terms with that. But otherwise, I, there is no real conflict in their letter. I cannot say that there may not have been conflict between them. I suspect there was, because she does say she cried for three months. She admits that later, much later, that she cried for probably three months when she first arrived there. So she did have problems. But um, she doesn't admit it so much later. She keeps all that to herself. And she doesn't admit it so much later. So I'm sure there was probably some conflict. I just can't tell you uh, with certainty what kind of uh, specific conflicts that those would be, except the ones that she talks about in her letters. Okay, so our next question is from Alexandria Russell. And they say, congrats and thanks for this great work. I was fascinated to see the full page flyer in the book of the American Negro Review that Mady Halzuma directed. Can you speak about her musical background and how that was tied to her ac activism? Sure, um, she was, uh, she learned to play the piano very young. Her mother uh, encouraged her to do that. So in Winston-Salem, she played the piano a lot. Uh, she also played for a concert in Charlotte. So she became a sort of statewide, people knew her uh, uh, for her musical talents. Um, she also um, did uh, recitations. Um, she put on all kinds of plays. Uh, they, she put on a, a one play, uh, and she does uh, these singing things, these cantatas uh, that she learned about at uh, what is now Winston-Salem State 
University. It was Slater Institute. Um, it becomes Slater uh, in, uh, Normal School, uh, and then it will become uh, Winston Salem Teachers College, and then Winston Salem State University. Um, and she would uh, she put on I mean just a number of shows. So a lot of them to raise money. Some of them were Christmas shows. A lot of them were biblical shows, uh, and um, just very engaged in uh, Winston Salem's cultural community. So it made sense that she would go to South Africa um, and she would do that review. The review was very much the exceptional narrative of Americans, of Black Americans, but she used South Africans to play those parts. Um, and uh, she, uh, they, uh, you know, they recited things um, uh, the South Africans did, but it was very American in so many ways. And she was teaching a lesson like she often did with everything that she did in these cultural events. So she was well known in the United States and then she would become very well known in South Africa for doing the same. Uh, and so that, you know, that American review is just classic maybe Hall Zuma, um, that she would use it as a teaching tool to teach them about the exceptional narrative of Black people. Um, Madam C.J. Walker is in there, uh, you know, politicians are there. Uh, Paul Robeson is there, um, and Paul Robeson is interesting because we see him as a, a, a friend and a host to uh, Alfred Zuma when he comes over to the United States. Uh, Eslanda Robeson, who also went to South Africa um, and uh, was a global traveler uh, herself, uh, and she knew Alfred Zuma. So it, it, um, it's, um, the, the review was to raise money for the coffers of the ANC, uh, but it was also a, um, uh, a, a, uh, something that was cultural that she, it just came natural to her. So she already had all these talents um, and was very much engaged in the cultural scene. Okay, so our next question is from Kimberly. And she says, thank you for this book. How would you summarize Mady Hall Zuma's legacy among South African women after 1963? Uh... I think the newspaper probably put it best. Uh, in the beginning, I talk about the, uh, the way the uh, South African newspaper sees her within a larger context of uh, um, uh, Willie Mandela, uh, of uh, um, a number of South African women who are very famous in South Africa, um, that they, um, she was among them. They actually put her there. And if you didn't know that she was American, you wouldn't know that um, in some sense, she, she didn't really belong there. I mean, if you've got these native South African women, but they see her as a key player in the struggles of South Africa. And particularly with the ANC, uh, and the newspaper is talking about these very prominent women, powerful women, who um, lived in, uh, you know, a mixed racism, and uh, uh, and and lived under patriarchy, and yet, you know, like I said, people like Winnie Mandela, who triumphed anyway, uh, and pushed the barriers, and they put Mady Hall Zuma in that list. And so when I first saw that, I thought, man. This is powerful. I didn't know what to do with it at the time, but then realized that I needed to put it there that the South Africans themselves, even in the 19, you know, in the 20, I mean, the 21st century, still saw her as a, uh, a major player in uh, fighting against uh, apartheid and the racism uh, that South Africans uh, had to deal with every day in their lives. All right, so it looks like we have time for one more question, and that is from Robert, and he asks, were there any collections to which you were denied access? Were there any gaping holes in the preserved record that frustrated you? There are always gaping holes. <laughs> there, yeah, there are always gaping holes. Uh, I was not denied any access to particular records except the CIA. Um, the FBI was quicker. Uh, the CIA, on the other hand, it was a whole year before I got a response from them. 
And it was all this cloak and dagger with a big envelope with a big piece of brown tape on the back to tell me um, that, well, if we have information, we can't tell you. <laughs> so um, that was the gist of it. They, ha it, it. they had it more polished than that, but that was the gist of it. So that was really the only denial. Um, but um, I suspect that there's way more than what I have, but everybody was open to me. Uh, and um, I have learned over time that I have to look in places that I would probably not even look in and look at documents that I probably under traditional sort of history research wouldn't examine. But no, I cannot say anybody held, you know, kept me from getting anything. Uh, and I owe a big thanks to the uh, interlibrary loan um, staff at the University of South Carolina. They got things that I could not have gotten. And also to uh, the Wake Forest uh, library staff uh, for sending me the Winston-Salem Journal um, that I had to, it's digitized up to 1929. And then after that, I had to sit at a microfilm reader and read every page to find her. Um, and so from 1930 to 1940, um, and uh, they gladly uh, ship those to me. But no, I can't say, I'm happy that I can't say that nobody, anybody denied me access, except uh, the CIA. <laughs> well, it looks like we're about out of time. Thank you so much for this wonderful event. Do you have any final thoughts for us? Um, I am hopeful that readers will find this story uh, as intriguing as it, I believe it is and um, come away with it and basically just say, wow, that, and, and, and be sorry that we didn't know about her before. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, just a reminder that you can use promo code MHX40 to get 40% off the book on the University of Illinois Press website. Um, so Zoom will send you an email tomorrow that will have that discount code as a reminder. Um, and thanks again, everyone, for participating today. Have a wonderful evening. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Congratulations, you. Wanda. Thanks, Deborah and Belinda. All right.